At the Maybe Farm, you'll find two buildings which were not constructed by the Maybes, but by us, the Schenectady County Historical Society. We put these buildings here to showcase some of the essential colonial trades which made everyday life possible. Today, we'll be exploring our blacksmith shop and speaking with our expert resident blacksmith, John. While there historically was not a blacksmith shop at the Maybe Farm, the Maybe family were known to be blacksmiths at certain points in their family's history. Okay, welcome to the blacksmith shop at the Maybe Farm historic site. Uh, this, pat this shop is patterned on a typical size shop that you would have seen in many colonial towns back during the 18th century. Uh, Jan maybe uh, had a blacksmith shop in the stockade that probably wasn't too different from what you see here. The blacksmith was responsible for making many of the tools that were used by the farmers, by the carpenters, and by the other trades back then. Even household tools that were used for cooking and preparing food were all made by the blacksmith. Anything that was made from iron. The blacksmith worked with iron. There were other trades that worked with gold and silver and copper and bronze and pewter and nickel and lead and the other types of metal. The blacksmith worked with iron and steel. So he made the tools that, were, that people used that were made from the iron and steel. And everybody during their day to do their jobs, to get their work, stu work done, some of the tools were made out of iron and or steel. Um, the blacksmith worked with other trades. He had to work with wheelwrights. Uh, made those big wooden wagon wheels. If you ever look at those, they all have an iron rim or tire around the outside. Uh, he also worked with uh, the uh, another trade uh, that was a type of blacksmith that worked in the shop with the other blacksmiths was the farrier. The farrier was the guy who made these horseshoes for the horses back then. He's the guy who made these shoes and put them on the horses. He was a separate trade. He was known as a farrier. He had to make the shoes and stuff for the horses because he was also a veterinarian. They didn't have spe specific veterinarians back then. So they would use a, a, a farrier would do that. And uh, so he was a type of blacksmith because he had to forge and shape the iron shoes. One of the jobs that the blacksmiths had back then, one of the jobs that they gave to the uh, newer apprentices that were in the shop. The apprentices that were in the shop were the, new guy, were the new kids, the younger kids that were learning the trade. Uh, back then, if you were going to learn to be an apprentice and learn one of these trades, you would start when you were around uh, 12 to 14 years old. That would be the end of your formal schooling. You wouldn't be going to school anymore. You'd be working in a shop like this instead of going to school. Uh, but one of the jobs that they gave to the apprentices was the job of making nails. They needed a lot of nails. The big barn that's in the center of the property here takes around 1,500 nails. That's about what it took for the average Dutch barn back then uh, on these farms. Uh, those, all those nails had to be made one at, one at a time by hand. They didn't have machines to make them. So they gave the job to the apprentices because it helped build strength in their arm, gave them experience as to how to work the iron and how to run and take care of their forge. There'd be two apprentices usually working together to make the nails. One of the guys would be back here running the bellows and tending the fire. Yeah, this is a type of bellows that they used back then. This is a crank bellows. Uh, they used to have the big wooden leather ones that pumped up and down uh, in most of the colonial shops. But what the bellows are doing is that they're pumping air or oxygen into the bottom of this fire. And that's what keeps the fire going. And that's how I get the temperatures that I need uh, to shape the iron. I need temperatures of over 2,000 degrees in the fire to be able to make shape the iron. So what, once they had the iron heated up, the end of this piece of rod, this is a piece of nail rod that's in the fire. This is the uh, iron that I'm using to make the nails from. Uh, once I have that heated up to around 2,000 degrees, I can then shape it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how they made the nail. first step is drawing out the end of the nail to a point.
it's almost a nail. Here you can see how John has drawn out the iron and sharpened it to a point, and is just about ready to detach it from the rest of the iron bar. The iron will cool down quickly, so John periodically has to reheat it in the forge so that it stays soft enough for him to work with. Here you can see John creating the flat head of the nail, which is just about the last step in the nail making process. When he's happy with the shape, he'll douse it in some water to cool it quickly, essentially locking it into shape. Now John does all this pretty quickly, so we'll have him make another nail just in case you missed it on the first run. A skilled blacksmith like John could make one of these nails about every minute, meaning about 60 nails every hour. And just like that, we've completed our second nail. The typical apprenticeship back then would last around six years. Uh, so from the time you were around 12 or 14 to 18 to 20, you'd be working in a shop like this six days a week, 12 hours a day. Uh, their work, work days back then were around, uh, where you, their work days were around 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours and your work week was six days a week. The only day you had off was Sunday, and that was by law. None of the trade shops were allowed to be open on Sundays. So it was a fairly long work week. Uh, when you finished your apprenticeship, after those six years of working in the shop, uh, you would be known as a journeyman. You'd be a fully qualified blacksmith. You could stay working here in the shop where you apprenticed, or you could go and work for somebody else. But at least at that point, you were being paid. You probably couldn't start your own shop yet. You had to save up money to build a building like this build your forge, and to buy your first anvil. The one tool that you can't make in the shop is your anvil. Uh, these were too big and too heavy to make in the regular blacksmith shops. They were made in the bloomeries and fineries and the foundries where they were making the iron, where they were digging iron ore from the ground and making the iron. They were making the bigger things like the anvils. Uh, once you were able to buy your anvil and start your own shop, very easy to do here in the Mohawk Valley. Anytime they're starting a new settlement, uh, that one of the first things that they would build in that new settlement was a blacksmith shop because everybody needed the blacksmith shop to make and repair the tools that they used every day. Many vital tools around the farm were made out of iron, such as this hewing axe here. The iron in a tool like this was so valuable that even as it was worn down and eventually became blunt, you wouldn't throw it away, but you would take it back to the blacksmith, who would weld a fresh cutting edge onto the tool for you. Other vital tools from the blacksmith shop include the tools that you would use to harvest your crops. Here we have a sickle, a small single-handed cutting tool. And we also have a scythe, a much longer, much heavier cutting tool. Both of these would be used for harvesting wheat. And you can probably imagine just how important it is that these are sharp and durable.
Even the hinges on your doors would come from a blacksmith shop. Items like these hinges show us that not only could a blacksmith make something that is useful or practical, they could also make it beautiful too. Blacksmithing can be an art form in its own right. Here we have an artful little design for a colonial waffle maker. Not only will these feed you, but if you open it up, you'll see it has a cute little heart pattern on the inside. Blacksmithing is an art form that goes back literally thousands of years. Different cultures around the world developed their own ways to work with iron and other metals like gold, silver, and copper. If you'd like to take part in the long human tradition of blacksmithing and learn some of these skills for yourself, you can keep an eye on our website. Blacksmith John often teaches classes for both kids and adults right here at the Maybe Farm.